Good morning. I'm Alfredo Sedun, and I'm coming to you virtually from my offices in Los Angeles. I've enjoyed very much going to the UMDF and meeting with patients and sort of wish we could do it again in person, as has worked so well before, but we'll make the best of this. Um, I thank you guys for this opportunity, and particularly the organizers, and most particularly uh, to Lisa uh, Point Snow, who uh, has done so much to make all of this uh, possible. So, of course, I'm here to talk about Labor's uh, hereditary optic neuropathy. Lisa asked me to speak about LHON um, as an issue um, from the patient perspective, and, and that's exactly what I propose to do here. I'll do in the first half of my talk some deeper understanding of the nature of this disease so that we can better appreciate the second half of the talk where I'm going to speak about what each individual patient can do uh, to ameliorate their circumstances. This is the standard slide that says I have no financial conflicts. I'm not paid for doing any of these things. So we know that labors begins with mutation on the DNA of the mitochondria, mtDNA. Therefore, it's inherited entirely through the mother's side. And we know that it interferes with the mitochondrial function, but still there remain some mysteries that are not explained by this. Uh, and I think these four big mysteries have propelled me for over the last 40 years uh, to think about this disease uh, all the time. And in 40 years of research, we've actually, I think, satisfactorily answered all four of these enigmas. The first is, why is it that some individuals get the mutation and never lose vision, and other people do? That's called the problem of variable penetrance. The second is, why is there a gender bias by which men are much more likely to lose vision uh, for, if, if they have the mutation than women are? The problem of gender bias. The third problem is that of sudden catastrophic loss. If this is a genetic uh, degeneration, uh, let's say like macular degeneration or Alzheimer's, you might expect a bit by bit, uh, many year, many, many decade uh, cumulative loss, but it doesn't occur that way. It occurs relatively suddenly, often over a course of only a couple of weeks. So it's a catastrophic event, and it does occur in both eyes, usually one after the other. Um, and then finally, why the eyes? More specifically, why the optic nerve? Um, that's quite remarkable. Uh, you've heard me probably say the optic nerve is the canary in the, uh, canary in the, the coal mine, uh, but all the cells of the body have mitochondria, and yet it seems to be the optic nerve that is uniquely susceptible to this disease. Much of what we've learned have been from these uh, 20 or so trips that we've taken about once a year going down to Brazil. This is a picture from one of those early years. Uh, I don't look so young anymore. But it has been Brazil, and more particularly, the wonderful families there that have uh, worked with us and the wonderful collaborators from around the world that have worked with us, that have brought much of the knowledge we have about labors that is now considered to be the standard model. In Brazil, we were able to eventually figure out that there were 362 members of this extended pedigree, which made it by far and away the largest uh, well-known family uh, of uh, labors in the world, uh, spanning eight generations and beginning about 1861, when uh, a, a woman immigrated from Verona, Italy, where in fact a branch of the disease still exists. But most of the patients of the disease remain in this rural area clustered between three cities uh, about uh, 100 kilometers apart, Victoria, Col uh, Colatina, and Santa Teresa. And it began when we were contacted uh, through uh, iFund, uh, a, a wonderful uh, agency, about uh, this uh, asymptomatic mother who uh, discovered the emails and discovered this disease and discovered us and sent me an email describing her 14-year-old son who had sudden loss of vision in the left eye. She thought it might be genetic uh, because her older brothers had both gone blind uh, in, in young ages. And she asked us to come down and see if we could uh, intervene before the son lost vision in the second eye. We were able to uh, get her a uh, bus fare and brought her to Sao Paulo where uh, our wonderful colleagues there at the university did the test that proved that she was right. It was 11778 labors. And uh, this is what the back of the eye of her son looked like. Unfortunately, by the time they arrived at Sao Paulo, the left eye had already started to look pale, uh, demonstrating uh, significant disease 
but even the right eye had shown swelling of the nerve fibers above and below the nerve, and both eyes had poor vision only to get worse uh, later on. So we went down to Brazil and we did many things. I'm going to emphasize one set of things now, which was looking at risk factors. And I'd like you to concentrate on numbers two and three in red. The first is that if you were a heavy smoker, you were uh, about four times more likely uh, to have uh, lost your vision for this disease than if you were not a smoker. Um, and for alcohol, it was about two times more likely. So that smoking and alcohol already distinguish themselves considerably here as being um, triggers uh, for losing vision. Other things can be as well. And by the way, smoking and alcohol, if you look over here, you see that it's more than five to one uh, ratio between the people who've lost vision affected and the ones who carry the gene but didn't lose vision uh, carry it. Now, the nature of this disease is to begin with a central black spot, which we call a central scotoma, which is relatively small. And over a period of few weeks for that to get bigger and darker, representing this loss of central vision. Then after many months, it just stays bad. And then one of three things may happen. In the best case scenario, we go backwards in time and it goes back to how it looked initially where the central scotoma shrinks up. Another good scenario is where a small area opens up as illustrated here, which we call a fenestration, uh, Latin for window, a little window through which the person can peer and have better visual acuity. But sometimes there's little to no improvement and it stays black throughout. Are there things that we can do to um, change the odds of one of these three outcomes? But before we answer that question, we have to say, what is the biology? Why do things go wrong in the first place? So this is the, the biochemistry. Basically, there is a series of uh, chemicals in the mitochondria, complex one and two, that pass the electron, like passing the baton down to three, four, and five, and this generates a number of ATP, normally five. But in the disease with labors, you knock out this particular mo molecule, complex one, it can't contribute its electrons, and you only put, produce four ATP, which is not so bad. That's not the problem. The problem is these electrons have to go somewhere, and they go into another set of chemicals, which we call ROS for short, that's reactive oxygen species, and they set up a signal. And we were able to recapitulate this whole concept uh, in, a, in a mouse model uh, under the auspices of Doug Wallace at uh, Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. Uh, this is published in PNAS, a very prestigious journal. And these mice demonstrated that the amount of loss of ATP and energy in the brain was negligible. This is not about the, lo the lack of energy. But they did show that there was an increase in these ROS that was very high and, in fact, I think catastrophic it causing damage, especially to their optic nerve. So this is the cartoon that conceptualizes what I think is going on. The blockage of complex one produces these ROS. Extra triggers in the environment, such as smoking or consumption of alcohol in excess, also contributes ROS. Altogether, this is too much ROS. And when you have high levels of ROS, it changes the characteristics of the mitochondria themselves their electrical membrane changes, and if it changes to a threshold critical level, a little pore pops open. Through that pore comes another molecule that sets off a cascade of, uh, of actions that kill the cell. And that these tend to happen where the mitochondria concentrate the most, which is in the eye, in this area we call the retinal nerve fiber layer, as well as between bundles of myelin in the brain, but mostly in the eye. And that's why it happens there. So this answers a lot of questions, uh, just to, to uh, summarize. The labors causes a block in this molecule complex one, leads to a small decrease in ATP and a large increase in ROS. Smoke and alcohol add in ROS. The renal ganglion cells uh, uh, that are in the optic nerve of the eye have the longest stretch without myelin, which protects them. So they're the most vulnerable to these uh, ROS-induced mitochondrial changes. Myelin turns out to be very protective, and most of the brain has myelin, but not that area. So now I leave you with the most important concept here, which is that this mitochondrial mutation that's inherited in labors is necessary, but not sufficient to cause vision loss. So that forces us to think, what does it take to be sufficient? And I think that I can summarize it to say one of five other factors. 
nuclear DNA genome, gender, smoke, alcohol, and certain toxins in the environment, such as particular antibiotics. In terms of the nuclear DNA genome, you do inherit some 40 or 50,000 genes from your two parents that can modulate the internal environment. So these are environmental factors, but they're internal in the cell. And there are, for example, two sort of types of labors, uh, which we've been calling type one and type two. Type one means that you've got this um, DNA genome, which is adverse and, and triggers it by itself. This tends to occur many more times in men than women at younger age, and it can be triggered by other risk factors, but it's sort of an inevitable situation because the internal environment is adverse. But in type two, these are patients who often are much older age when they lose vision. They tend to be heavy smokers. The loss of vision is slower. And we see on examination that they don't see well, the visual fields are bad, but there's still a lot of fibers left intact. So we call it more function and less structure loss. And this can be reversible because this is an external environment type cause. In terms of gender, as I've alluded to before, women are more often gonna stay as carriers and not convert to become affected men are more often going to be affected. It depends on the mutation, but in terms of numbers, using just the 11778 mutation, which is the most common, they can vary from three to one to five to one, with the predominance being in men. In our particular large uh, Brazilian pedigree, about 12% of women and 46% of men were involved, so it's somewhere between uh, three and four to one. But there's a second time that women tend to be at risk, and this is near menopause, when they lose the risk factor uh, benefit, the benefit factor of estrogen. And so some of you know that I advocate hormonal replacement therapy whenever possible for women about age 50. Smoke, you don't want smoke. Smoke, not just smoking, is very bad. We reported a case uh, in Northern California where somebody who lived uh, near um, a tire fire, downwind of a tire fire, this was a woman who lost vision, as did two of her daughters, one of them very young, and this is extremely unusual, and they all lost vision about the same time because the smoke was the problem. There was recently something um, in Paradise, California, a huge wildfire, and it billowed through uh, some populated areas in San Francisco. Um, we've had cases uh, where people who were exposed to the smoke from bad or malfunctioning stoves uh, loss of vision. And so my recommendation is if you like barbecue, go ahead and eat it. It's not a problem with that, it's the smoke. So make sure that you're not the barbecuer and that you stand well upwind of the barbecue set. High doses of alcohol produce reactive oxygen species. Enough alcohol to give you a sense of a buzz is enough to produce RLS. So if you feel a buzz, it's too much. I used to say, therefore, that one glass of wine a day was probably acceptable uh, because it didn't produce the reactive oxygen species. But I had one patient in particular, when he heard one a day, he actually heard seven a week. And he comes in and says, I'm only drinking on Saturday and I save up and I have seven drinks on sa uh, Saturday, seven beers it was, which it completely was the opposite of my point. That's a dangerous situation where he's creating a lot of ROS on Saturdays. Um, I've revised my advice for that reason and for other reasons. I just say avoid alcohol because once you've had that one glass of wine, you may not hear my voice in your head anymore saying don't have the second. So perhaps it's best just to avoid it altogether. And I said, there are certain antibiotics. Uh, this list is obtained by anybody who comes through my office. But uh, it is these seven antibiotics that are perhaps most likely because they were engineered um, by, by nature to kill bacteria. And uh, hundreds uh, of millions of years ago, billions of years ago, actually, um, the mitochondria in our, our bodies came from bacteria. So they have similar chemistry. And what affects one affects the other. So basically, risk factors of which you can change. You can't change the uh, DNA that you inherited uh, in terms of the mitochondrial mutation. You can't change your modifying DNA in the internal environment, but you can change the estrogen levels, the smoke, the alcohol, and the use uh, chronically of these antibiotics. And so I advise doing just that. The general plan is to avoid this. These are sections of optic nerves in our labs. This is normal, mild, moderate, severe, and extremely severe. The dark represents the intact axons, which are everywhere here and only a little bit left there uh, in the extreme case. And even if you can't avoid having the attack altogether, 
you want to stay on the left-hand side of the scale. So that concludes my talk. Again, I wish I were able to be there with you in person, and I look forward to perhaps doing just that next year. Thank you.